Okay, I believe we're up and running then. All right, everybody, um, welcome to today's uh, legal workshop. Um, I'll give this brief little video of me here, but then we're going to be moving through a PowerPoint for most of it here. So we've got some live attendees, um, but we are going to be recording this as well, and it will be available in the future. Um, as you'll see, and as I note throughout, though, um, a lot of this, uh, the law and the regulations and new processes that are being rolled out are developing awfully quickly. Um, there's been a lot of action just recently, a lot of things still up in the air. So keep in mind today, as we were recording, is July 1st, 2022. So uh, we'll be continuing to provide these updates um, and getting out information as it continues. But uh, it is kind of a moving target at the moment. So um, with that said, um, my name is Justin Edge. Um, I'm a staff attorney. Um, at University of Illinois Chicago School of Law and our community legal clinics and the Community Enterprise and Solidarity Economy Clinic. Um, now I am going to go ahead and share my screen here and I believe should be moving to full slideshow mode. Can I get, because I will not be seeing many thumbs up, can I get a, a verbal okay that you've got a full screen there that you are viewing, um, not presenter mode with notes, but a big wide green screen? Looks good. Thank you very much, Renee. All right, so um, I already introduced all that information, but yeah, today we've got a legal update on the uh, Illinois cannabis industry. And uh, as I said, there's a lot going on. I'm Justin Edge, just told you about me and to tell you a little bit more about our legal clinic. Um, if you're not familiar, um, we work with uh, a variety of businesses and legal issue areas aside from um, uh, cannabis law and social equity applicants within the um, cannabis um, licensing system. Uh, we work with worker-owned cooperatives, other types of cooperatives, nonprofits, uh, small businesses, um, lots of different things. And the thing to know about the general nature of our work um, is that uh, we are working with students to provide legal services to uh, community-based organizations that um, wouldn't be able to afford the legal services or want a specialized approach or want to work with students in some form of solidarity based on the philosophy that we try to approach this work with. So um, you can apply on our website. There are links at the end of this presentation for full-blown legal services, um, which we take on new clients for transactional law matters related to all of this. Um, as you see there in the description, uh, we do that with the semester cycle beginning in August and in January. But aside from that, we also do workshops and um, presentations on different topics, including cannabis law um, within our social equity cannabis initiative. And one other uh, service that we offer that I hope that you can share, um, you know, know that it's available for you after today and also share with other people is that we have a brief uh, legal advice line. You can call and make a reservation, or you can use our website, a link that I have at the end of the presentation, make a reservation. And it's a 25 minute simple free phone call with an attorney to discuss whatever the issue might be that you're trying to work through related to uh, your, your cannabis business. So um, that is another one of the services that we offer. All right. Justin, I think we are, we're seeing presenter mode. Oh, wow. Let me. That's important. We can change it, but so we see the next slide. Um, and a sure. Note. Yeah, it would just be. Let's just get you to a better view. I don't have any um, embarrassing notes or anything, but uh, we might as well at least get to a better view. Renee, thank you for that. It'll take me just a minute to figure out.
How about that? Perfect. Wonderful. And is it tracking? I think it might be a little. All right, I see the thumbs up, Renee. I'm just making sure that it's continuing to advance because you're just looking at the disclaimer page right now, I believe. Okay. Are you still looking at my screen there that says disclaimer? Yes. And I think you're going to have to share your screen again. So we don't see anything. Thank you, Dante. I see you down there. All right. I think if we've got this now, you see disclaimer and then be able to see a different slide now, yes? Yes. Wonderful, thank you for the patience. Okay, so uh, you had plenty of time to read the disclaimer, so I won't bother uh, reading it, um, but you know, the point being just that legal advice is not something that can be done in a generalized fashion. Um, and so there's a good chance you might need to speak directly with an attorney. But like I said, we have different forms of resources that we might be able to provide to you um, uh, to get you to an attorney, whether it's uh, short, you know, some brief advice or um, something through the clinic or refer you out to other attorneys as well. But all right, moving on. So um, we're not going to um, spend as much time today um, discussing some of these things, because what we're, we're probably, if you've been following this carefully, you know that a lot of things have been changing very quickly. We have um, an initial application process that was put into place with laws that were uh, came into place in 2019, and then um, applications in 2020, and then we had uh, some new laws passed in 2022, or 2021, and then many of which were put on hold. Um, but what we're generally going to spend less time talking about are issues that are closed or that are kind of in the past. Even if we are now talking about what's going into, okay, now you've been selected in one of these lotteries, and now we've got to go from here to getting business up and running. Um, I just don't think it uh, is worth spending a lot of time discussing the applications as they looked back then or deficiency notices, processes, or anything like that. If you have questions about that, um, stop me and we can talk about that. Um, and then we're also kind of setting aside, you know, the medical um, dispensaries, cultivation centers, and the earlier forms of licenses. So we're really focusing now on the um, current rounds of um, um, licenses, um, provisional and conditional status that have come out for craft growers and infusers, and as well as um, three different, they called it by three different names, lotteries that have happened for dispensaries that have just all been opened up because of some of the um, litigation uh, that had stays on different parts of the um, licensing process that have been lifted partly or fully. And we'll discuss that a little bit more. The one big thing I want you to know though, is if you're on today, because you have recently received word, and I mean between March and as recently as you know now, whenever you're watching this, if you receive word that you've been selected in one of these lotteries, 
each one of these programs have different turnaround periods in which you need to get some paperwork out the door back to the licensing agency, and in some cases, pretty darn quickly. Um, in with some of the new regs that we're going to talk about, it's periods as brief as three days, not many of them five or ten. Um, but, you know, there's also a hard and fast day, for instance, for July 1st for some of the forms being due today, in fact, by the end of the day. So um, the most authoritative information, because it varies so much, is going to come directly from that contact reached out to you from the licensing entity for your type of license. Um, and they're going to want to speak to the primary or secondary contact as you listed it on your application to answer any of those types of questions. And they'll be able to give you those dates and tell you things. But we will speak to some of the things that are more uh, generally applicable as well. So why is this all confusing? Why do we even need legal updates? Um, there's a lot of money at stake, and that's part of what creates you know, a lot of the push for litigation. Um, the laws weren't written particularly well at times, um, which has created some of those avenues for some of the litigation. Um, and we're dealing with um, legislation, bills that were considered in different forms that then passed into law that may have looked a little bit different. Then we've had some amendments, particularly with the, um, the House Bill uh, 1443 that passed in 2021. And then we have regulations, regulations being issued by different legal or different state agencies that have the administrative authority. And then we have actions beyond that, right? Actions including them answering your questions and putting out FAQ documents about a certain application or issuing the application itself or scoring the application. So this and all the complexity is what has created a lot of the confusion, um, the need for all of this extra information um, and uh, a lot of the litigation as well. So, um, so, uh, and then just some confusing things, especially if you're just reading about it from more general sources, such as the newspapers and things, you'll hear a lot of terms really interchanged where they'll say things like, just saying something like the lottery, where there are multiple types of lotteries for different types of uh, licenses or they'll refer to the lotteries that just happened in June for the dispensaries, which were after a the um, one of the cases lifted the stay on that. They'll refer to those that just happened within the last month as last summer's lottery. Well, that's because they did begin in 2021, as was the plan, but then were delayed because of all the litigation. So uh, don't feel like you're missing anything. This is confusing for everybody. Um, and 1443 um, and a lot of what you may have heard around um, when that bill was changed, that's more or less what we're functioning under at this point. The changes and the updates to the law that were made, particularly a lot was done with dispensaries, but there were a lot of other changes made um, as well. And uh, that's, you know, there were some legislative pushes that actually have been taking place in 2022 that haven't actually changed. What has changed a bit have been some of these regulations that are coming out, but uh, more or less the way the law stood after House Bill 1443 was passed in 2021, um, that is more or less the state of the law as of right now. So there were like issues, as I said, with how it was written. I mean, I think that maybe the, the thing to just to real quickly go through the litigation, not in, in a lot of depth, but um, we had multiple cases that ended up kind of getting bundled in two sets, one of which was contesting the licensing process around the dispensaries um, and in its original form, but particularly with changes that were made after HB 1443 uh, passed, um, particularly those people who were not awarded licenses um, and believed that they were wrongly denied, believed that criteria that shouldn't have been considered was considered, and that's what created one of the stays. And then there were additional issues created, similar issues, on the side of the craft grower license and the infusers were it also there were some cases related to the infusers as well that were kind of tied up with those um basically the news is that 
um, what you heard about with some of these reaching some resolution with the craft grower licenses um, was actually all resolved first, um, beginning just a couple months ago. And so the first of those new licenses, um, the ones that have been a provisional state were able to move forward. And then so there were new licenses actually drawn as well to fill out the, the, the numbers of licenses that hadn't been picked prior to the um, stoppage because of the state through the courts. Um, and there are some issues remaining to be resolved on the uh, dispensary case, um, but the judge has decided that um, at least a, a portion that allows for additional licenses to be drawn through lottery and that process to move forward, that that can continue um, without, you know, the stay actually, um, the stay being lifted just partially for that. So there's still some ongoing litigation, some, some more stuff that can happen, but those have been big changes. We saw um, big numbers of licenses being issued for, um, or provisional or conditional um, status happening because of being drawn through the lottery process in uh, April and May of this year, as well as in June. And in fact, um, some of those um, quite recently, in, e in each one of them, they rolled them out through the Bureau of Labor Statistics regions, beginning generally with Chicago land and then moving out to the, the other um, areas as well. So um, where does that leave us now? Um, I mean, I don't think I need to go into too more about the, the legal issues, but it they may continue to develop, but I'll give you some updates later that generally look like there may be fewer litigation challenges creating issues moving forward. Um, you know, and something that you probably heard that the state is quite proud of is that some of these changes have worked that were put into place um, with um, that were put into place with the legislation from 2021 larger percentages of owners who are social equity applicants. Um, and then there's no requirement that people report on race or ethnicity. But among those who have, we've seen, you know, very high levels um, that um, that people were hoping to see, um, considering the overlap with the war on drugs and, and what was originally called in the legislation, the disproportionately impacted areas, which is one of the criteria for social equity applicants. So where are things right now? Um, the top line there, if you if you have applications going with any of these, um, you know these entities that you're dealing with. But this is these are the sources, right? These are that's um, the Department of uh, Financial and Professional Regulation and then Department of Agriculture. They are the ones issuing the licenses. Um, they are the ones who are um, issuing the regulations. Um, there is, although there are many of these things are written out in the law, if you go look up the actual law, um, the uh, Cannabis um, Tax and Regulation Act, there are also regulations which are going to be in the resources that we'll send around. In many cases, those regulations completely match what the law states. But in a lot of cases, they've added additional elements as well, some of which might be knocked out by some of this um, litigation, as a matter of fact. But um, so when you're looking back and you're trying to see, OK, I see how they're citing something here and that I need to make sure that I'm addressing this because of this deficiency that I'm seeing in my application. You know, keep in mind, you're not just going to that section of the law. You're going to that section of the regulation as well, which might have additional information. And so hopefully the, the uh, resources that we'll send around will be able to link that out. And um, uh, one of those that I'll uh, make sure is in there is a really, really convenient table that's actually associated with each one of the applications that Department of Agriculture oversees. And so that's the transporter, the craft grower, and the infuser, where it actually lists the number of the question and then the applicable section of the law and the applicable regulation so that you can like see I don't fully get what they're asking here and turn right to it and read it it's a great resource just a little one pager for each one um, I discussed the stays being lifted and where all of those are at um, and um, all I'll say as we move on past this is 
you know, again, the confusing language, the lottery, lotteries. There were actually three different lotteries that began or stayed by the litigation and then have opened up again in June. Um, qualified applicant, social equity applicant, and tied applicant. They did slightly different things and they were meant to move in that order because they were trying to basically, it was for different reasons due to the uh, court order as well as why they were trying to maximize the number of social equity applicants if possible. So that's what people just received notice about. If you're one of those people um, and you received notice in just the last few weeks that you got one of these, one of the things they notified you about is that they need to see today, July 1st, 2022, by the end of the business day, um, updated principal officer affirmation forms. So you're free to jump off the call right now and go do that. Um, or you can see a couple more tips I've got in just a minute about those, and then you can hop off and go deal with that. Um, and uh, yeah, and as with, um, as you probably noticed, if you are in any stage of license approval, you know it's not just you got it congratulations. There, the steps continue and continue and continue. I've got a document that I'll be attaching as well that shows you just documents that whether you've been asked for them or not, you can go ahead and start to anticipate that you need to get together. Um, everything from financial documents to finalized policies that you know may or may not look exactly like they did when you drafted your application in 2020. Um, things such as a floor plan now that you actually have a facility um, lined up and under lease, and those types of things. And um, this is just something because we've been hearing a lot of questions about like, well, I ha still have an application out there. What does that mean anymore? I haven't been selected yet, but am I going to still be considered for future rounds of um, lotteries and things? Um, this is all, this is pretty much the best knowledge that we have at this point. Those applications that were submitted in 2022 and that have now gone through a couple different lottery selections and scoring processes, the initial one, and then the ones has changed under 1443. For the dispensaries, those and that pool of applicants, it's still there, it still exists, but our best guess at this point based on these regulations, these new ones that we're gonna look at in a few minutes, that they create a new application pool, is that those are probably going to, that they're not gonna just keep going back to that trough, that, that those applications that were submitted in 2022. More than likely, whether they officially notify you that those are done forever or not, um, you're, if you're looking to do work with dispensaries, you'll need to be probably looking out for these new applications new systems, new application pools that will have new lotteries with new rules. With craft growers and infusers, we don't really know. We don't have any clear information at this point, whether they'll they'll revamp it and do a new licensing process as they're doing with dispensaries or if they'll keep drawing back on the applications out there. And the different one is transporters. Transporters, because they are you know, constantly, anytime taking applications, they've been issued several new versions of the application for the license. There's not a cap on the number of licenses, so there's not a need lottery. So if you meet a certain threshold in the points, they approve it. So it's on a rolling basis. So the thing with those is if you're looking to do that and you haven't put an application in, just make sure you're looking at the most recent one. It's on the Department of Agriculture's website. There is a 2022 application. Um, but if you look back for the other applications, they're the same, the craft grower and infuser, they're the same applications that were put together in 2019, early 2020, and, and put out then. So there's nothing new at this point to report there. So um, yeah, like I said, timely, if you have been selected, um, there are a number of um, dates that'll come up on you pretty quickly for some of these things, such as the principal officer affirmation, um, uh, such as the tax compliance portion of that, where they need to see not only that the principal officers have been filing 
on a regular basis, but that they've also um, have paid their tax, um, paid their taxes uh, and are current as well. Um, there are also, though these are different under 1443 rules, the law as it currently stands and the regulations as they currently stand, there are limitations on the number of simultaneous applicants that principal officers can be on. And those were quite high before. Under the new regs that we're going to talk about in a little bit, those numbers are shrunk down quite a lot. But if you're currently working with an application that's in a form of approval post lottery right now, you're under the old standards. You're not, you don't have to deal with these new regulations that we're going to be talking about. And so you're going to want to go back to the look of the law as it stands right now. Um, and uh, they're going to need to see updated tables of ownership. And then um, they're also going to be notifying you, as you're probably aware, if you have been notified that you'll have 180 days to secure a facility, um, as well as um, submit updated floor plans. And then that just begins more or less. Uh, they're going to go through all the different documents that were originally required for your application. Um, and need to just see that everything's updated, further affirmations, that nothing has changed, all of that. So, um, like I said, though, the dates vary. So, um, rather than putting a bunch of different ones up here, even, I mean, the, the lotteries have been even been in different waves that have different dates associated with them, but it all should be in the notification uh, email or letter that went to your primary and secondary contact listed on your application. Okay. So um, with that, we're just going to move to what we're seeing as some of the most common issues that we're hearing about at the moment, um, both that we're hearing about here through um, these brief legal advice calls that we're doing with folks, um, but also from our talks that we're having with other technical assistance providers for other social equity cannabis businesses. Um, we talk regularly and share information, and we're also um, given information sometimes a little early, but maybe mainly just a little bit more insight from folks at the state agencies, at the licensing agencies. So um, that's where some of this is coming from. And um, I've got a couple uh, documents that we'll be sending along with the resources that um, are the latest info from them on these points. So um, much of that on the left, I already discussed the principal officers um, one uh, some of the questions that have come up around principal officers and tax compliance um, got into some really great questions that apparently no one at the state had an answer for right off the bat, which will sound really familiar to anybody who has another business, another side hustle, works as an independent contractor, and that was, what about people who pay quarterly taxes, self-employment taxes? Um, you know, what is considered timely as far as payment? Um, what about doing these, uh, at, you know, these attestation uh, forms today, July 1st, when, you know, we have quarters closing at different times and quarters have periods that are, they're backdated for, right? So um, we finally got, or the best answer they've given us for that, which is a, a one page, um, section of the uh, of the revenue code that they're going to use as the rule for that. So that will also be in the attachments as well. Um, so uh, yeah, and that, so that's some of the stuff that I would just uh, point out to you. Um, we're also hearing that they, if they are finding that a person is not in compliance, they're going to, they are actually allowing, and it varies by program, they're allowing time for people to actually correct the deficiency. So in other words, get current by paying their taxes or get current by filing. Um, and, you know, then these vary from, you know, 60 days, 90 days, different things like that. So just because, oh, shoot, somebody, one of your principal officers, and you, you, you know, if you put together one of these applications, you may have 20 principal officers that, uh-oh, someone's behind, you're not necessarily lost. Um, but it is something you need to jump on and address right away because what they are doing with these lottery systems is if you are not actually giving them the forms that they need by the dates that they're asking for, 
in some cases, there's a deficiency period of only five days where they say, we're going to move on if you don't respond. In some cases, there's not. You lose it. You lose the license that you've come this far for. They move down the line to the next draw in the lottery. So watch out for these. They, these, uh, these are important. Um, ownership structure updates. I think that what I'm, I've been hearing about this a lot from Renee since I began working on this, that this has been happening for a while. It's going to be happening even more so now that businesses are being notified that they have been approved and right now they need to submit an um, updated table of organization. Um, so it's going to force it to move a little bit faster. But for anyone who has been moving through this process, even if they had a, um, a provisional license or trying to move forward, anyone who's put together that this is going to take more money than I initially thought and I need another investor partner, or um, this is was taking just as much money as I thought it was going to, but now I've been paying money on this commercial lease holding this space for however long or, or whatever other holding costs may be, um, bringing in money is uh, one of the things that's leading to um, uh, shifting around um, ownership structures. So um, the bottom note there is just, as I said, like the rules are going to be not these new regs. The rules are going to be the old descriptions of what a social equity applicant is. Um, so as, if, as you shift it around, if your license was contingent because you were a social equity lottery winner, for instance, contingent on you being a social equity um, applicant who actually got that social equity um, applicant points, and you had to have that to get that type of license, keep in mind, you've got to keep that together, even if you're shifting around things in your ownership and control structure. So that said, um, I wanted to red flag one big, big thing here, which is an area of law that it's very easy to get cross crossways with, and that's securities law. Um, what the word basically means is offering an investment opportunity to the public um, where they're going to, you know, make some type of return by no work on their part. You know, they're going to sit back and, and receive some financial return, right? Um, that, those laws were put into place to protect innocent investors, people without a lot of money from being sold, you know, a piece of blue sky or being sold, you know, that, 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 you know, story about the, you know, part of a swamp down in Florida or whatever, right? That's what those laws were meant to create. But they are quite expansive and they have civil and criminal penalties, especially if you're doing so knowingly. They can include a bunch of things you may not even consider. Loans can potentially be um, securities. Um, and keep it in mind that it's not just the act of signing the piece of paper with the person and handing them a loan document or a membership share in your LLC. It's also offering a security. So that means putting things in print on a website, uh, in a newspaper, or speaking about them publicly and offering this great investment opportunity. Um, it's a big, complex area of law. And to do a capital raise that complies with securities law can cost a lot of money involved in attorneys. And we here at CSEC love all of the things that are out there in this movement towards community capital and raising you know, capital in smaller amounts from a local level so that people can keep their money local and have a hand in their community and all of this stuff. And uh, But the truth is, if you're trying to move fast right now on your application, that's not the path for you. That is a long path. And it's also one that requires money and attorneys. Um, so all I would say is under the, under the with the advice of an attorney, um, if you're looking to bring in money partners, it's going to, you to be probably through people you have established relationships with, not any blast out to the public. You're usually going to be dealing with accredited investors which you can just Google that term, but it's we're looking at high wealth individuals. So we're looking at people who have a net asset level of a million or above and uh, more an, an equivalent income level. Um, 
or we're looking at um, possibly looking at a person who's coming in as a vital part of your business. And they're not just going to be sitting back as an investor. They're going to be in the trenches. They're working with you every day, a partner to partner, day to day operations. So that's a quick securities brief. Generally, it's very complex and make sure you get some help with it. And it's not something to scramble around for and put out, you know, broadcast to the public that you're looking for funds and that they're going to make a return on it and that type of thing. That's how you can get in some big trouble. Um, also, all of that, all of that, all of those, whether it's loans, um, equity positions, all of that stuff is going to be completely reportable to the licensing agency. Every everything, every last bit of that is covered in the regulations. So it's uh, there's no way to hide it. They're going to want to know where every dollar is coming from. So um, they'll be on the lookout for that as well. Um, so uh, just other things, what to expect next. I think I've addressed that in lots of other places. But um, as I said, in that list of documents, keep in mind to whatever extent you can get ahead. Great. Go ahead and do it because you'll see in that list of documents some or in that list of like what other documents to anticipate coming next. And I've mentioned a lot of them, but, you know, they're going to be talking about qualifications of any new principal officers. They're going to be looking at updates to your employment policy. If you had to have one of those for your facility, they're going to be um, looking at updated security protocols. Um, even if you submitted a general plan for that, now that you've got a specific building, they're going to want to see that updated as well. So uh, just keep in mind that if you can get ahead on any of that, it will really help you, especially if, um, if you know, you've already got the, done the difficult part of getting this far through the lottery. And then um, one of the big things you have coming around the corner for basically all of these types of businesses other than transporters is securing a location. Um, any of you may be doing this right now. Um, you know, varying amounts of time that you're allowed to, to get them moving, but 180 days is common for a lot once you're first notified. So you need to get moving pretty quickly. Um, you, as you might be aware, you may have had uh, something locked in or an understanding with an owner a long time ago that has fallen through or that you might need to restart the discussion about, or that you might need to, in light of um, what is what you're hearing is working for other people getting their facilities approved you're going to need to do a different build out it's going to be more expensive so there's going to be zoning related to your use of property as well as build out that's going to happen um, after you get your site approved you're going to start your build out and there'll be building permits and those things as well so what i would just say about this is if you're in there's a, a pretty um there's a, an established process for this at the Cook County and City of Chicago level. They've at least seen a good number of them at this point. Uh, generally, things don't move very fast in zoning, and generally, it's a good idea to chat with your alderman. Um, that's just a general rule, but you can find information on their website about how to do that process. In other municipalities um, and counties, they've got pretty broad jurisdiction. They can't like effectively outlaw this type of business by restricting the zoning beyond a reasonable amount, but reasonable is a fuzzy word and intentionally so. Um, so we are seeing, we have heard about um, counties that have effectively said there is one place where this can happen. Um, even though you know there actually could potentially be up to three licenses awarded for that particular type of business in in that area. Um, so some of these things may be challenged. Um, generally, challenging zoning laws is a very particular area of local knowledge for attorneys. You'll want to hire someone locally. You'll probably, the general word is you're not going to fight it out in court unless there's a lot of money at stake. Typically, you're going to try to be as civil as possible, work with whoever the body, the um, 
quasi-judicial body or whoever is overseeing this um, special use of uh, zoning that you're trying to get requested. So um, seek some local help um, if you encounter any resistance um, when you go to speak with the people at City Hall. And then a big thing, because there are a lot of steps here that you can see build on each other, right? To make it pretty clear, and it's probably already quite clear to you, you've got, um, you, you know, you may have uh, had to stake out uh, uh, or get, you know, some form of firm um, commitment on a facility before putting in your application. Or, okay, or say that you did when you first heard that you got a provisional license a long ways back. Um, and then you're going to need to turn around and buy or lease that space. But then you're also going to need to move through this slow process, of getting the zoning approved, getting the space designed and getting that approved, beginning the build out, which we're hearing that actually the beginning the build out is often being allowed by ID, uh, PF, or ID FPR. Um, they're actually allowing people to begin the build out based on the plans that they're seeing prior to an inspection, but there will eventually be an inspection and then you're gonna be opening up for business. So you've got a lot of things that have to line up. And all I would say is just, if you're more familiar with residential leasing or other types of leasing, things that are just more common businesses, uh, say a restaurant or things like that, just know that commercial law behind leases is very different. It basically sees you as equals, you, the tenant and the landlord. There are very few protections in the law for you. If it's in the document, it's in the document pretty much. And if it's not in the document, it's not there to help you out. So that said, what I have here, this is called lots of different things, a termination right, a tenant's contingency. And don't, I know this makes your eyes cross even looking at it. Don't try to read it all here. I just wanted to kind of give you a couple examples of, of this type of language. If Even if you're not drafting the lease, if it's a, uh, an experienced commercial landlord, they're going, they will have seen something like this in the past. It's always very common in any business that's going to require the approval of a liquor license, for instance, a lot of restaurants. But anyone who's trying to get some type of zoning approval or something, they've got to actually get the property locked in either with an option, you know, option to purchase or an option to uh, off on a commercial lease. They need to get it locked in in some kind of way, possibly even signing the lease, but they need to have some ability to get out and not owe what is often 10 years, five years, 10 years, 15 years of rent in a building that they're never going to be able to use for the purpose that they initially wanted to um, use it for, right? So um, it goes beyond just what you see here on the slide. You're going to see that these will usually have um, a number of these different dates and how long they have will be um, negotiation points. There'll be notice periods. And then there will be things as well about, you know, what's considered good faith effort and getting it all approved. Um, you've got the fact here that we've got multiple types of, we got a zoning process as well as a licensing process through, ever, through whoever the licensing agency is. Um, we've got renewals of licenses that have to happen as well. So this is something that you're going to want to address in your commercial lease and, um, and, and take into account very, very carefully when you're thinking about it. Okay. All right. So any this is a good place to stop, actually, if there are any questions that have come up, um, because after this, I'm just, uh, we're, we're moving through to discussing what this new dispensary application system is going to look like. So I'm guessing I don't see any hands or anything. I see some things in the chat, but I suppose Renee has probably been doing a great job of answering those. Okay or it was all my problems with the visuals earlier. All right, so I'm gonna move ahead then. So you may have heard announced in March actually uh, that the Pritzker administration said, uh, look, we've heard everybody. We're not getting, we're not doing this social equity thing as well as we could be doing with dispensaries. We're hearing that it's incredibly complicated 
We're hearing that it costs you thousands and thousands of dollars of your time, attorney's time, consultant's time to get an application in place only to maybe get it, maybe not. So there are a lot of good things that they are saying that they hear and that it does seem like they are at least trying to address here. Um, it's moving pretty darn fast. And what uh, you should know is that just that this is this is different than the process around, you know, the public reaction in 2020 to the first licenses being awarded and then House Bill 1443 being passed in 21, revamping the whole licensing system. This is all happening through regulatory law and it may be in place within the next couple months. So they uh, first put out the applic or the uh, the initial applications in um, as I said in March. There was a period of time which has actually just passed in which they were accepting written comments. And I'll just say that generally, I don't know the the regulatory system can be quite a bit less transparent than the general, you know, legal process that happens down at the General Assembly. Um, they at least have to follow a lot of steps and they have to take into account public written response. And we talked to several other um, technical assistance providers who put in some comments and there are significant changes that have been made from the first draft, this that came out in March to the newest version of it. Um, so let me just say, the biggest thing here is that we are talking about a different definition of social equity applicant, okay? And when I say it's evolving really quickly, the dates are there in the second bullet point. The dates being that March this came out, um, just two Tuesdays ago, um, the second form of the rule came out and they went ahead and got on the calendar for July 12th this July 12th for the committee that actually does the final review of any new administrative rules of new regulations. So there's a good chance it's going to pass on that date and be going into effect immediately or shortly after. So I'll just say that if you read the first form of that proposed regulatory change or read any articles about it, about what came out in March, some of it's the same. A lot of big changes, though, with what came out two Tuesdays ago, and I'll go over those right now. Um, and um, and so it's actually this form of it. It's not like the, in that committee they're going to weigh the two and pick their favorite. It's the secondary form that came out two Tuesdays ago that we're going to discuss. That's more than likely going to be the regulation and is going to be the new system for new applications, new lottery, new social equity applicant definition for dispensaries. Okay, and, I'll, and also just, this is specific to dispensaries. None of this at this point affects any of the regulations that are already in place for craft growers, infusers, or transporters. All right, and yeah, it, and also they're saying that with this approval, the applications could go live up on the website and be open for, they say a period of at least, I forget, it's at least a couple of weeks that it will be open and live. But um, I'll go ahead and send you a list along with the resources of what goes on to this simplified application, what they'll be asking for. So you can go ahead and get that ready. Um, it is a lot simpler, obviously, than the full-blown, um, you know, simple 100-page long application in some cases for dispensaries uh, from that 2020 round. Um, but I think the real thing is what's not so different when I point out there is ultimately you're going to have to get all the same stuff together. You just have to get together less of it up front. And then after you are notified that you have won the lottery for what will end up being 55 licenses and 55 licenses that are every one of them going to social equity applicants under this new definition of social equity applicants, all 55 of them. Um, once you're notified, then you'll have to put together the information. Um, and then some administrative law changes that I won't go into much that will make, make it less likely that there will be 
successful substantive challenges on the law, like we've seen with some of the other things that held up, that created the stays that, um, you know, were in some cases valid, uh, challenging the very validity of the entire licensing scheme, the entire application scheme and all the regulations because processes were had some technical flaws. So they've got a lot of good stuff in there that hopefully will make this more straightforward and and um, yeah, and we will we will see. But here's the big, big thing. Um, if you're familiar with the old social equity applicant definition, it used to have uh, a, more or less three different parts to it, you know, um, um, or you could look at it as four. You were personally affected by the war on drugs through having one of these now um, expungible uh, lower level possession or distribution cannabis charges, or a family member of yours was, or you lived in what were called disproportionately impacted areas. It was a big, long technical definition, but the important thing was you could click through a map that made it pretty simple and see shaded areas and look up by address where these areas are, where these areas had higher levels of policing, higher levels of arrests targeted by the war on drugs over decades. Um, and you had to show that you had lived there uh, five of the 10 last years. Okay. And there are different ways, documentation that they explain on how to prove this. Um, and then there was a final section, which was essentially dropped after 1443 was passed. And that was what they called the promise to hire. And there were some other, um, there was a lot of criticism around this. Um, either hiring or making a promise to hire 10 people who either were impacted by the war on drugs or had family members who were, or lived in a, um, a disproportionately impacted area. So that, as those stand, is all still in place for the licenses under transporter, um, infuser, and um, I see your hand, Renee, and for craft grower. What's your question, Renee? No, we have a question in the chat from Laura, which I think is a good one. Um, just wondering in terms of column one, if there's also a requirement that um, to qualify the, the census tract has to be within the state of Illinois. Under the previous regs, all of the uh, maps and the way in which you qualified in terms of um, your residence location was within the state of Illinois. So I'm not sure if you know for sure, Justin, whether or not they're proposing that this has to be within the state of Illinois. Great question. I've got the regs right in front of me. No, no, it does not, it does not say Illinois, which is interesting too, because um, another, you have a good eye. Another, it's a good question for another reason. Another thing that was dropped, another requirement was for social equity applicants um, and it was a point bump of five points for any applicant was that you be an Illinois resident. That's also not required any longer. That was what that one that is one of the ongoing legal issues actually with the uh, dispensary um, litigation cases. So um, you're not actually required to. And those census tracts could presumably be anywhere. So this is opening up to a lot of people. Um, so yeah, um, and just to maybe take a step back real quickly, but while I was blabbing on, you did the right thing and read the slides because the slides have the important information. We are dealing with the same situation as before, which is for, to qualify as a social equity applicant, 51% of your business is owned or controlled by people who individuals who meet one of meet these definitions. So I described the old system. That was the old system, 51%. The first form of these regs when they came out in March had other changes. There were changes that were around, um, you know, you could have a lower percentage of social equity, individual ownership, 
and still qualify if you agree to source some, you know, this percentage of your goods and services from other social equity applicants. All that got struck in the second version. None of it's in there. It's just this. Um, so what do you need then? It doesn't matter how many people add up to your 51%. They don't have to meet the same prongs of the tests. It's just a matter of all the people that add up to the 51%. And that would also be people who control legal entities that control a certain percentage of that 51%. Just if you have extra legal entity layers there, do they, do they qualify for this? And to qualify, they have to have one criteria under column one and one under column two. If they meet that, they're good. Now it's not mix or match. It's not, well, I can do four years of a census track with that poverty rate, but I only did four years there, but then I lived another four years in census tracks where 20% of people receive SNAP. It's not mix or match like that. It's you meet one or you don't. If anyone who's familiar with a lot of these statistics that are used here, they're the eligibility criteria that are used for a bunch of different programs. And they have a lot of overlap, not complete overlap. So presumably it does open up quite a bit more. And not in the, across state boundary lines is a very important one that I hadn't thought about. Um, but, uh, but you know, there's not full overlap here. And you'll notice that the last one isn't even locationally based. The last one, is not about residing. It's did you receive four, five out of the last 10 years, one of those forms? And you'll notice that subsidized housing is in there. And it didn't define it any further than that. So that would mean Section 8, AKA housing choice vouchers, AKA any, or, and then any other type of um, publicly owned housing, that would presumably include anyone in what's called a LIHTC a property. Okay, so low-income housing tax credit property often look completely indistinguishable from other apartments. They're not owned by the housing authority. They're, you know, you probably know if you're in them, but it's worth looking into. So a lot of people could come in there as well. And then one other new thing I would add, under column two, we've got one and two there. Um, are from the old definition. There's nothing there for the promise to hire part, right? That's gone now at this point. There's also nothing under the disproportionately impacted area. In a way, you could qualify just with that before and you see something like that under column one now, right? So now you sort of have to have disproportionately impacted area of some type by one of those definitions, right? and something in the other column. So in this way, it's a little more constrictive. But then also that third one you see there, an individual who has been a victim of a firearm injury. And that's as defined in the regulations, um, as I'll send them around, you can read that. It's a quite an expansive definition. And as late as, if not before, the day that they open the application, they are going to put out lists of every type of document that they will use to allow people to establish all these things. You won't have to gather them and submit them right away, but you'll be able to know that, oh, okay, well, I don't have that, but I can get that. And then what you will do is if you're a principal officer, say, you're going to have to attest on the online application, yes, I qualify as a social equity applicant. It's unclear right now whether you'll have to check which boxes, but you just say, yeah, I qualify. One or the other, you know, I've got one under column one, I've got one under column two. And because you'll know what documents you'll need, you don't have to have them, but then it will be immediately followed up after you're selected with, we need to see the proof now. You have this much time to get us the documents. I see your hand, Renee, go right ahead. Yeah, so Dante, I think, had a, a really good question about the new criteria. And I think I just wanted to, and maybe you can just um, emphasize this, Justin. Um, 
you know, I just wanted to say in terms of actually meeting this new criterion for social equity, equity applicants, it's not that every owner has to um, qualify under these uh, new uh, criterion. It's that 51% or the majority ownership of your business's application has to be held by either an individual or individuals. So it can be several folks who would qualify under these criteria. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that helps. Yep. And, and ownership or control um, is an interesting question because that's the way the words that they always use. They even with the old um, the laws that stood before 51% ownership or control. No one's really pushed to that. Um, but I can tell you just from like the work that Renee and I do on other corporate law matters and governance structures and things like that. I'll tell you what that doesn't mean. It doesn't mean 51% of the money in the picture. And it doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, uh, you know, it, yeah, 51% of every dollar contributed. It's ownership and control. So for instance, and this happens all the time, particularly in a situation where there's uh, any kind of business where there's a money partner and there's a managing partner, this person brings in less, this managing partner, but they may be 50-50. So say there may be 50-50 on control, but then the money could work even different. The money could be split 50-50 or the money could you know, pay a basic salary to this person, pay back this person's full investment, and then it splits 50-50. So like none of that's been fully worked out, but ownership and control does not mean the money is all equal on the way in or the way out. It's ownership and control. It's And those can't get too far out because of some tax to out of line because of some tax principles. But if, for instance, you wanted to broaden the control through a, a board of directors, perhaps you to pass that 51% threshold have to set up something more like, you know, um, a set of your owners, regardless of how much money they put in, who become your board of directors, kind of a governing council of sorts. And, you know, there are five of them. And now you've got a person who has 20% control of day-to-day -day operations and important decisions that are being made, even though they maybe were only able to put in 10% of the money. And that might be able to push you over the limit, right? Because that's ownership and control. So again, it hasn't been worked out the limits to which that could be fully pushed through, but you could presume it, it, it does not say that the money has to equal that way. So there's some flexibility there when you're considering um, how to get past that 51% threshold. If that makes sense or that helps at all. It's the kind of thing we could talk through in one of those brief calls. It's not something you could resolve over a brief consultation call. It's complex stuff, but discussing options, you could, uh, you know, schedule one of those calls with us. So um, I'm going to move on. You'll have effort. You'll have access to this later, um, and I'll just send you the regs as well, the updated regs, um, because these are my. This is my my simplified version of what they say. Um, they actually have links to the specific authoritative data set for each one. So the where you can find the USDA maps for what's considered a food desert and you know where you can all of this info so that you can actually look up a map. And presumably once they get this approved, I would assume that they're going to create one map on um, IDFPR's website that like with the uh, disproportionately impacted areas that will layer all of these together and allow you to search by by address. I'd be really surprised if they don't do that because it's not very difficult for a tech savvy person to put something like that together. So um, hopefully you won't have to pick through it all and follow all these links all the way, but, um, but you can use the links in what I send you to go pull maps of this today if you wanted to, so. All right, so, um, and you'll see also in there the definition of, um, like I said, of uh, firearm in injury as well. So, um, yeah, I, we've we've hit all of these, I think, as as, um, as we've gone through. Um, 
including the you know early stuff you may have heard about percentage of purchase none of that has changed um and i think we're safe to assume based on the way they made these changes in the regulations that this is going to be kind of the base model going forward for dispensaries at least um there's just really little value in them going back the other direction and they added new sections of the regulations but then they also made some changes to core definitions like they could have just not referenced disproportionately impacted area in the new part but they didn't they went back and deleted it out of the general definition section so that tells me that like they seem to be moving everything this direction if that makes sense it looks very different than for instance uh, 1443 looked if you looked at that because basically they created they left everything that was there before and then they just created a new section for oh and then we'll do these new types of licenses and we're going to drop this uh promise to hire provision and oh we'll do these new types of and they just added new sections and left all the old this looks like a more permanent change um that will probably continue to be tweaked but yeah i think that we're probably not going to be looking back at that original applicant pool um probably ever again um for those that were submitted in 2020 for um dispensaries and uh i don't know what it tells us about whether this is the path things will take with department of agriculture um i don't know that would be you know it's it's a push from pritzker's office it's announced with pritzker's office but you know to some extent each one of these agencies are independent and they do have their ability to pass their own regulations um so they may choose to go a different route all right so with that i've got uh just a couple links that i got together here uh which is how to schedule a brief um, legal advice call and then just you know where you can find videos of our prior presentations and more stuff on our social equity cannabis initiative um and because i have like a bundle of documents some of which don't actually have good links but were like emailed from people in the state and agencies i want to just basically create a bundled up document list that's got everything attached and send it all to you so um i'm not trying to be secretive about it or anything i'm going to send it to you and you can feel free to send it to whoever you would like i haven't been promised to keep i have not promised to keep these things secret when they've been shared with me they're just not easily available um at a web link that i can find so um so yeah so i uh, i will follow through with that i don't know if it'll be by the end of the day because we're going to probably wait for our it people to um uh, finalizing this video. So I would guess uh, look for it early next week. Now, would anyone like to ask any questions right away while we are, we've got about 15 more minutes. We could ask questions now and do them on video, or we could wrap up our video and uh, call that portion of it over. And I'll just hang out for a few minutes in case there are some other questions. So does anyone have any burning questions they want to ask right now? Okay, what I'm going to do then is go ahead and stop the video. Thanks for attending, everybody. If you um, are on the call and you want to stick around for a couple more questions, I'm going to stay on. I'm just stopping the recording. But for anybody who's watching this later, um, thanks for watching. And again, look back for other videos from us. Um, we will obviously want to be doing an update on this as, once these regs are firmed up and once we see more of the rollout for the new dispensary online application system because we'll want to get that out very very timely and uh, give people everything they need about it so look out for more um, as late as early fall they say all right stopping the, the uh, recording now and thanks again okay it tells me the recording has stopped so do you all have really juicy questions or do you just call it a Friday afternoon? Thought maybe you had some really good ones you wanted to ask off record. Those were good, really good questions that you have. It tells me that you've been following this very 
carefully. So um, 